Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church in Redwood Falls. I believe Pastor Scott and Pam are back home now, and Scott will resume his duties tomorrow. Um, follow along while I read the vision statement of your church. God's timeless love transforms each of us to joyously continue the ministry of Jesus Christ in our community and in our world. Please join with me in the call to worship. We come to worship this morning to hear the good news. To hear about the importance of being clothed with humility. We are reminded to act with justice, to love tenderly, and to always walk humbly with God. Let us pray. Merciful God, as we enter Holy Week, turn our hearts again to Jerusalem and to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Stir up within us the gift of faith that we may not only praise him with our lips, but that we may follow him in the way of the cross. As we remember how Christ the King entered Jerusalem to the sound of joyful shouts, increase our faith and listen to our prayers so that we may praise you every day by living always in him. Create in us a humble heart as we strive to be more like you. In your name we pray, amen. Please stand and join in our first hymn, Come Live in the Light.
let us confess our sins before God. Loving God, on this day, your son entered the rebellious city that later rejected him. We confess that our wills are as rebellious as Jerusalem's. Our faith is often more show than substance. Our hearts are in need of cleansing. Have mercy on us. Help us to lay at your feet all we have and all we are, trusting you to forgive, to heal, and to receive us as your own. Amen. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now share the peace of Christ with one another.
going to invite the children to come up. Now, please, for a children's sermon, a little message. I know there's a few of you here. Come on. Oh, yeah. Oh, my. We can walk. It's so good to see you. Do we have, do we have anybody coming over here? Yes. Yeah, I see you have an owie there, huh? A Band-Aid. Come on up, ladies. I want to tell you what a marvelous parade you did this morning with your palm branches. Was that fun? Do you like parades? Are you good at pretending? Can you pretend? Can we pretend just for a little bit this morning? We are going to pretend that we are watching a parade. What do you see when we see parades? What do we see? What do we see? Balloons. Sometimes really famous people are in parades. Wow, wow. What do you see when you go to a parade? Okay, okay. Well, we're going to pretend this morning that we are watching a parade. Okay? And so let's get ready, because I think the parade is coming right down that way. And here comes the parade. And first thing we're going to see are, um, let's see, oh, oh, it's the flags. Do you know what we do when they come by with the American flags in a parade? We have to stand up. Here comes the flags. Come, flags are coming. We, we have to, yeah, the flag. Pretend we're seeing a parade. We have to put our hand over our hearts, because here comes the the flag, the American flag is coming by. That's pretty important. Okay, that's, that's gone. Okay, we can sit back down again. <clears throat> and we're going to watch the parade. Um, let's see. Here comes a marching band. I really like marching bands. Here they come. They're playing their music. They're marching. Oh, you hear the trumpet. Awesome. I love it. I love it. You're great. Oh, you are just wonderful. This is so much fun. And, uh, oh, clowns, look out, clowns, they're coming. Oh, they got squirt guns, look out, look out. You know what they do with those squirt guns? Look out. Oh, my goodness. Oh, way, way, way down there, look at those people. They are so excited. There must be somebody really famous coming. Oh, they're really, really, oh, the people are jumping up and down. You know what they're saying? They're saying, Hosanna in the highest, or something like that. They're just waiting for someone to come. And, oh, they're just, the crowd is getting bigger and bigger. <gasps> Do you see the crowd coming bigger? And then, what is this? It's some guy riding on a horse. Oh, and the crowd, they're waving palm branches, and they're saying, Hosanna. Do you know who it is? Who is it? Who comes to rise? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. He's coming riding on a horse. And he's coming into the city of Jerusalem. And everyone is so excited to see him. But you know what happens? On Sunday, the crowd is so excited about him. Later in the week, the people get pretty nasty. And things don't go so well for Jesus. So this is what we call Holy Week. And this is a time for us to think about what Jesus had to do for us. And we have Thursday coming up when Jesus gets together with his disciples and he has a supper and he goes and prays. And he's praying to God the Father. You know, if there's any other way I can do this, can we figure something different out? <laughs> but God said, no, this is what we got to do. So, you know, Jesus suffered, and he died. But then next Sunday, what happens next Sunday? What? He rose again. He rose again. So next Sunday, we get together again, and we are all happy. Because we celebrate Easter. Will you pray with me? 
Dear Lord, we thank you for coming, for living on this earth, for knowing that Palm Sunday was going to be a big celebration, but that this was going to be a tough week. And we thank you for agreeing to do what you needed to do so you could die and forgive us, and we can have eternal life. And we hope that we can all get closer to you this week and remember you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You have been great parade watchers this morning. Thank you so much. You can go back to your seats. Thank you, Dory, and thank you to Elaine and the choir for helping with the service this morning. Listen to these words of prayer of illumination. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you. And now if you would turn to Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11, for the responsive reading this morning. When Jesus and his disciples came near Jerusalem, he went to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives and sent two of them on ahead. He told them, go into the next village, where you will find a donkey and her gold. Untie them and bring them here. Then come and bring them to me. If anyone asks you why you are doing that, just say, the Lord needs them. Right away, he will let you have the donkeys. Announce to the people of Jerusalem, your king is coming to you. He is humble and rides on a donkey. He comes on the colt of a donkey. The disciples left and did what Jesus had told them to do. They brought the donkey, they brought the donkey and its colt and laid some clothes on their backs. And then Jesus got on. Some people walked ahead of Jesus, and others followed behind. They were all shouting, Hooray for the Son of David! God bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hooray for God in heaven above! When Jesus came to Jerusalem, everyone in the city was excited and asked, Who can this be? The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And now turn in your hymnals to 196, All Glory, Laud, and Honor.
next scripture reading is from Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 7, and I'm reading from the New International Version. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Back when he was the head football coach of Troy State University in Alabama, Chan Gailey and his team were playing in a national championship. Gailey was headed to the field for one of the team's final practices before the big game that week when his secretary called him back to take a phone call. Gailey, not wanting to be bothered or distracted, told her to take a message. She said, it's Sports Illustrated. He quickly turned around and said, I'll be right there. As he made his way back into the building, his mind raced with excitement as he thought about the upcoming article. He was sure the people at the magazine wanted to write about him and his team and the school. The closer he got to his office, the more excited he became. A featured Sports Illustrated article would be great publicity for a small school like Troy State and himself. Theirs was a great story, but it would be hard to capture in a simple three-page article. By the time he got to his phone, he was imagining that he might even be on the cover. His head was spinning with possibilities. When he picked up the phone, the person asked, is this Chan Gailey? He confidently responded, yes, it is. The person on the other end of the line said, well, this is Sports Illustrated, and we are calling to let you know that your subscription is about to run out and wanted to know if you are interested in renewing for the next year. Gailey's comment on the incident was, you are either humble or you will be humbled. Humility is an important but overlooked and undervalued virtue, especially in our self-exalting, self-taking, Photoshop-filtering, look-at-me social media culture. But humility is a hallmark of true Christianity. It is evidence of true spiritual growth along our faith journey. However, transforming from pride to humility can be one of the toughest challenges of the Christian life. We human beings are seekers. We seek truth, glory, wealth, security, power, happiness, recognition, and immortality. We also seek wisdom and knowledge. All humans, by nature, desire knowledge. Long ago, as fallen humans, our sins had separated us from God. And God is holy and cannot abide with sin. It is simply incompatible with who he is. To bridge the gap, we know that God came to us in human form to bear our iniquities and unite us back to himself. In the same way that sin contrasts with the holy God, Pride opposes God. All sin begins with pride. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. You may remember Muhammad Ali, who was a very spirited 1960 Olympic boxing champion, who went on to hold the world heavyweight title three times. He was known for his personal catchphrase, I am the greatest, which he was never afraid to tell you. There was reportedly an incident just before takeoff on an airplane flight when the stewardess reminded Ali to fasten his seatbelt. Superman don't need no seatbelt, Ali arrogantly yelled. Superman don't need no airplane either, retorted the stewardess and said, put on your seatbelt. This is an example of arrogant pride that God hates. The Bible says, who is wise and understanding among you, let him show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Humility keeps us focused on God and his ways. In our scripture reading tonight, or, or to this morning from 1 Peter, the Apostle Paul had been writing to his brothers and sisters in Christ who were suffering persecution and hardship for their faith in Jesus Christ. 
Much of the letter exhorts them to be faithful in their stand for Jesus Christ in a hostile world. At one point, he tells these people to be clothed with humility. We are to humble ourselves in the sight of others. In other words, we who are in Jesus ought to be careful about how we speak even of ourselves because we're talking about someone Jesus loves and for whom he died. To humble ourselves means that we cease trying to elevate ourselves above each other and willingly accept the position of service toward each other. In addition to being humble ourselves, we must, must teach our children to be humble. My eight-year-old granddaughter played basketball this winter on a team in Des Moines, and her dad, my son, coached the group of third-grade girls, which in itself was a very humbling experience for Tom. Since my granddaughter, Cove, could walk, she has had some kind of a ball in her hand. She and her dad have spent countless hours playing catch with a football or a softball, and they shoot hoops both inside their home and outside at a nearby park. As a result, unlike some of the other girls on her basketball team, going into the season, Cove knew a little bit about playing basketball. During one game, Tom called a timeout and told Cove to pass the ball instead of to always take the shot at making a basket. Well, Cove, who is really very sweet with a very kind heart, who at times displays somewhat of a strong personality along with a little sass, puts her hand on her hip and says, I would pass the, doll, the ball if anyone could catch it. <laughs> Obviously, Cove must work on becoming a better team player and developing humility. Robert LaRoe preached, humility is not inferiority or poor self-esteem. It is seeing our strengths and weaknesses honestly and not letting either keep us from accomplishing what we need to do. Humility is recognizing that our strength comes from God. It is simply making a truthful, modest estimate of ourselves. In today's scripture reading from Matthew 21, Jesus and his disciples were on the Jericho Road. They had already climbed most of the treacherous pathway that twisted and turned for 17 miles from Jericho up to Jerusalem. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. By this point in Jesus' ministry, most of the disciples had learned to do as they were told. So the two men went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. In ancient times, when a king rode into a city, it was usually with the show of power and wealth. Thus, one might have expected Jesus to enter Jerusalem at the head of a mighty army, bearing dazzling prizes for his royal treasury. But here's the surprising thing. The rightful king, the victorious king, is also the humble king. Jesus comes to greet his subjects, not with pomp and circumstance, but with all humility and meekness. Humility is one of the royal attributes Zechariah mentions in his prophecy. See, your king comes to you in all humility. The king's humility is symbolized by his mode of transportation. At the very least, one would expect Jesus to ride on a very fine horse. But instead of coming on a mighty war horse or a proud stallion, he rides a lowly beast of burden. He is riding a donkey of all creatures, and a borrowed donkey at that. As Clarence McCartney writes, how strange a contrast to the triumphal entry of ancient warriors and conquerors into the cities which they had taken. This time, no wall broken down for entry. This time, no garland and hero standing in his war chariot, driving down the lane of cheering subjects past smoking altars and followed by captive, captive kings and princes. Instead of that, just a humble, meek, lowly man riding upon the foal of a donkey. In addition to Christ, there are many people in the Bible who exemplify humility. One of my favorites is Solomon. He is not an ordinary man. 
He is the king of one of the most powerful nations at the time. He was blessed with splendor, power, and vast riches. Often, wealth is accompanied by pride, boastfulness, and arrogance. But Solomon did not have any of these traits in his heart. One day, God appeared to Solomon in his dreams. God then asked him what he wanted to have. Solomon, being the humble person he was, only asked God for wisdom to rule and lead God's people. God was very pleased upon hearing this and granted him wisdom along with all the other things he already possessed. Solomon spent his life honoring the Lord's name. He built temples where he prayed to God, and he remained humble until his death. The story of humility in the Bible reveals the blessing received by those who are humble. Solomon did not brag about his riches. He was powerful, but he knew it was only because of God. Solomon was known to kneel in front of many people, which is a depiction of his humility. The world leads us to believe that we need grand wealth and material possessions and fame and validation. But Solomon knew that what he needed was wisdom and a relationship with God. He knew that the most important thing in life was to put God first and to humble himself before him in all things. In Second Chronicles 7.14, the Lord said, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. One of God's favorite ways of encouraging us to humble ourselves before him is by anonymously doing kind, helpful things for others. In Matthew 6, verses 1 through 3, Jesus tells us, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth. They have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that it may be in secret. And then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. In other words, God does not want us to put on a show for others in order to make ourselves look good. My husband's family was a recipient of an unforgettable anonymous act of kindness and generosity during the Christmas of 1969, my amazing mother-in-law became a widow at age 39, with six children ranging in age from 15 to one and a half years old. There was little money. So as that first Christmas after her husband's death was approaching, Leona sat down with her children and explained to them that she couldn't afford to buy the food to make their traditional Christmas dinner of turkey with all the fixings. And there was certainly no money to buy any Christmas gifts that year. A couple weeks later, the Ellingworth family returned home after the Christmas Eve church service to find several boxes that were piled on the family's back steps. Inside those boxes were turkey, potatoes, fruit, vegetables, pies, and cookies, and beautifully wrapped gifts for each child that contained socks, mittens, wool hats, and books. To her dying day, my mother-in-law never did find out who had brought her family all those things at a time when there was little joy in the aftermath of the death of their beloved husband and father. What a humbling, Christ-like act of kindness that made a huge difference in the life of a poor, grieving family. Charles Stanley once wrote, Humility in the life of the believer is the mark of greatness, not because you shine when you are humbled, but because when you submit to God's will, he shines through you. Let me say that again. Humility in the life of the believer is the mark of greatness, not because you shine when you are humbled, but because when you submit to God's will, he shines through you. As revealed in our Bible, we learn from the greatest example of humility, which is in Jesus Christ. When we read stories of Jesus' interactions with people, we witness true humility over and over again. 
He values people who are habitually ignored by others, children, the socially excluded, the sick, and even those suffering from demonic possession as described in the Gospels. 2,000 years ago, Jesus achieved the extraordinary and shifted the whole conversation around leadership so it became impossible not to think of leaders in terms of their humility or lack thereof. In Matthew 23, verses 11 through 12, Jesus said, He who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself with haughtiness and empty pride shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be raised to glory. Jesus himself said it very plainly in Matthew 11, verse 29, I am gentle and humble in heart. Jesus was born in a stable, in a little out-of-town, out-of-way town. His family was poor and had no status in society. The witnesses of his birth were shepherds, sheep, and cattle. He was called the Lamb of God many times in Scripture. A lamb has no power. It is at the mercy of the shepherd. Jesus said to his disciples, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Whatever titles we may have earned, whatever degrees may hang on our walls, being like Jesus will mean we never lord our authority over others, and we must never try to make them feel inferior to us. And then in John chapter 13, we really see the selfless Savior in action. On the night before he died, Right after supper, Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He took the place of a slave before his men. He took the place of the lowest-ranking servants of that day. Since people wore sandals everywhere, their feet were filthy. Foot washing was considered to be a very dirty, smelly, and humiliating task. Thus, it was not common for the host of the master of the house to wash the feet of his guests. It was the work of the slaves. So when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, he broke the accepted rules of the day, and that is why the disciples are so shocked. Jesus served with no expectation of reward. And he served with a willing, kind heart. He even washed the feet of Simon Peter and Judas Iscariot, two men who later betrayed him. And then when Jesus had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. He looked at his disciples and he asked, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. And now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash another's feet. I have set you an example that you do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. In this passage from John, Jesus makes it clear that serving others is not an option. It is a command. And we are never more like Jesus than when we are serving others. When we humble ourselves and assume the position of a slave before others, we demonstrate true Christ-likeness. And when we do, he is glorified, and he will honor our service in his way for his glory. A time when I felt especially humbled took place nearly six years ago when I was inducted into the Redwood Area Hall of Fame. And while it did seem amazing and unbelievable to me to be rewarded for working in a profession that I had dearly loved, that of being a teacher, what touched me the most was the family, friends, 
former colleagues and students who came out that evening to celebrate with me. It was especially meaningful to me that my dad could be there because his health had started to decline by this point, and this was one of his last times out in public before he died the following year. And after I re returned home that night, and as I started saying my evening prayers, I was overcome with emotion. I remember feeling such intense gratitude to God for having been born to Christian parents who had always loved me and supported me along both my educational and spiritual journeys. I expressed gratitude for my husband, children, siblings, extended family and friends who had traveled long distances to be here to share this evening with me. I thanked God for giving me the skill set and the opportunity to work as a teacher and to be in a position to hopefully make a positive difference in the lives of young people on a regular basis. I totally gave him the glory for any professional success I had experienced. And in that moment, I truly felt thankful, fortunate, and especially humbled. When we seek to use our gifts and talents for God's glory, we advance the kingdom of God. But humility is the key to making all that work. Humility allows us to work together in unity. It allows us to extend grace and forgiveness to one another. The key to transforming from pride to humility is to clothe ourselves with humility, which means that we simply think of ourselves less and submit to the Lord. This is faith. Through humility, we trust God to provide for us and to bring about his divine purpose for our lives. And then when we are successful, we are to give God all the glory. Today we celebrate Palm Sunday, the day when the crowds gave Jesus a royal welcome. He was coming with all humility to be their righteous, victorious king. It must have been an amazing sight, not to mention an awesome sound. Jesus approached Jerusalem at the start of the Passover feast when hundreds of thousands of pilgrims were crowding into Jerusalem. As he came to Bethphage and mounted his donkey, he would have been surrounded by people going up to Jerusalem. And when he reached the top of the Mount of Olives and looked over the city of Jerusalem, he would have seen crowds of people streaming out the city gates. And as the word spread that the king was coming, the pilgrims who were already in the city came out to greet him. And then as Jesus rode down into the Kidron Valley, there were people in front of him, behind him, all around him, and they were waving the palm branches, which are an ancient symbol of victory. And they were throwing down their robes to make a procession of praise. And they kept shouting and shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. It was exactly the kind of welcome Jesus deserves. He is the son of David, our true and rightful king. To him we give all our hosannas, for he is our gentle, humble savior. Jesus humbled himself unto death and opened the path in which we too must walk. In death he gave the highest, the perfect proof of having given up his will to the will of God. He suffered unimaginable pain for you and me. And then just before he breathed his last breath, he prayed, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. This was the prayer of total and complete submission and confidence. It is for this reason that we know we can humble ourselves before God and trust him completely because we know that God has the power to turn the agony of Good Friday into the ecstasy of Easter Sunday. He has the power to resurrect, and he has the power to take the cross, the emblem of suffering and shame, and turn it into the greatest symbol of victory this world has ever known. Amen. And now, if you would stand, and we will sing hymn number 720, Jesus Calls Us.
please join with me in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I encourage you to take a look at all the um, announcements that are printed for you in the bulletin. Are there any announcements that anyone wants to highlight or add? Yes. Um, last Monday, I'd, I'd like to see Jackie sign in prayers and thoughts of Slan's mom. Uh, her husband died of 50 plus years on Monday. And uh, she's getting through it, but it's, it's, a, you know, it's a life partner. Right. The uh, house is quiet. And so I just like to have some thoughts for her. Sure. We have a sign family our prayers. Any other announcements, joys, concerns? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son and for paving the way for our lives to be all set free through Jesus' death on the cross. Thank you for what this day stands for, the beginning of Holy Week, the start of the journey towards the power of the cross, the victory of the resurrection, and the rich truth that Jesus truly is our King of Kings. Thank you that your face is always towards the righteous, and that you hear our prayers and know our hearts. Help us not to follow after the voice of the crowds, but to press in close to you to hear your voice and seek after you alone. Palm Sunday is a reminder of the unexpected yet fully anticipated King of Kings. Jesus did not look like the Messiah their people expected. The way he humbly entered the holy city of Jerusalem on that day riding a young donkey as a significant sign of peace and fulfillment of prophecy did not align with the people's expectations of a military conqueror. Much of our daily lives don't align with our expectations. So much of our lives don't make sense. This Palm Sunday, let us embrace the unexpected entrance of our Savior Jesus. He is peace and humility. Let us apply this incredible truth to our lives. Strengthen us against the temptation of Satan. Lead us to a stronger faith that replaces our doubts. And create in us a humble heart that is obedient to you, that cares deeply about others, and that holds you at the center of our lives. Now we lift up the Syme family. Please surround Mrs. Syme with comfort and with the support and love of others and remind her that she is not alone, that you are there. All this we pray in your name as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. At this time, the offering will be taken.
Let us pray. Almighty God, on that first Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into the city where he soon would die. Just as his disciples and the crowds blessed his entry, spreading garments and branches, so we've come to lay at your feet these gifts, symbols of all we have and all we are. May this offering be our nonverbal Hosanna as we bless your beloved Son, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Now turn in your hymnals to the final hymn, 263, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Now, let us remember to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you not only during Lent, but every day. Amen. <laughs> 